which we call Christmas, people full of cheer, and all the kids so wishful, but most of all, to make it complete, there's you, the mistletoe and me. the nature clad in white oh what a thing for love and through the house all this reaches you the mistletoe and me listening to the sound to come with you Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portrait, the show that aims at shedding the light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of this country and on Black excellence. We are continu continuing today with our series of interviews, which are dedicated to the National R&B Music Day that will be celebrated on March 2nd, 2024. And to talk about this and represent Black excellence, we have a very exceptional guest, Miss Heather Hayes. Welcome to My Harlem Portrait. Hello, how are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you. Our special guest today is nothing but the daughter of the legend, <laughs> iconic singer, songwriter, music producer, producer, actor, Isaac Hayes. And she is the founder of the Heather Hayes Experience. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Italian and Italian people love your dad. I mean, <laughs> thank you. Saw him in all movies and so it was fantastic. My, I grew up with, seeing him in movies so mm -hmm. awesome so how was it to have a father as legendary as yours and a mentor like a godfather of soul james brown growing up um well i think a lot of people don't understand my dad was just my dad so you know when you're born in a situation like that you don't really know or care because i think oftentimes our parents really tried to keep us kind of away from that and have kind of a normal, you know, go to school, pick up slumber parties, you know, do your homework, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think the only difference is, is that once you become like preteen and teenage age, then you start, you start realizing when other people call it to your attention, because outside of that, it's just normal. You know, he's my dad, like he's making me eat my vegetables and do my homework. Like, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really register. Um, and I started working with James Brown when I was shortly out of high school. And that was an incredible experience because I just learned about, about tenacity and drive and professionalism. Um, and he kind of took me under his wing. I kind of, I lied. Well, I didn't lie. When I auditioned, I used my mother's maiden name <laughs> um, so that if I got hired, I got hired solely off of my talent. And so I don't think he found out who my dad was until about three months into me working for him. Oh, wow. Um, so that was really important for me to just know that I'm getting hired for my skills. Because I think oftentimes people think that because you have a famous parent, things are easier for you. And it's often not. It's a double-edged sword. Um, I think people... The door might open for you, but they're much harder on you. The expectation is higher. 
And a lot of times people are not so nice because I think they view us as people who have everything and who haven't worked for anything, which is completely the opposite. Mm. And so it was just really, it's really important for you to be on top of your game and be professional and, you know, work at your craft. And so that's just what I did. So both of them treated me like daughter, you know, of course my dad, I'm am his daughter, but Mr. Brown treated me like one of his kids. Um, and I learned a lot from him and my dad was just my dad, you know, the Isaac Hayes, hot buttered soul shaft thing was really secondary to us. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I, that's the reason why I asked this question because I know that for people who are daughters and sons of very famous and iconic people, it can be really, as you said, the double head sword. Mm -hmm. And they can be treated harder than others because they are expected to be like their parents. Yes. But by yourself. Yes. <laughs> and you want to yeah. be yourself. You yes. don't want to be compared all the time. Yes. And that's, that was actually my second question. You paid your dues, I said, working as a dancer, choreographer for James Brown and as singer for very iconic artists, I, I, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Sean P. Daddy, Arrested Development. I love the Arrested Development. <laughs> Night and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about this. You you have a little already said about not taking your father's name to go to the auditions and so on. So you dealt a little bit in, in that. But tell me what maybe the one of the best moments you had in your career and one of the most challenging. Um, I think the best moment and the most challenging was the Michael Jackson job. Um, I was, so I didn't audition for that job because again, a friend of mine that I went to a performing arts school with, he basically called and said, Hey, do you want to do this? And I had done some work for him before. Um, and by this point I had already been, I had already worked for James Brown. And, um, I think that because, uh, it was a dance job, it was for a short film called ghost. And I think when I got, when I flew out to LA and I got in the room, I was recognizing dancers that I idolized as dancers. So there were dancers who danced from Madonna, Janet, Michael. And I just was like, why am I here? Um, and I literally asked my friend, I said, why did you call me? Because I don't want you to call me because I'm your friend. You know, mm -hmm. I want you to call me because I can get the job done. And he was like, I called you because this is a very athletic, strenuous, you know, kind of job. And I knew you could get the job done. And he was like, I wouldn't ruin my job calling and hiring somebody that couldn't do the job. And he was like, everybody in the room was handpicked for a very specific reason. Mm -hmm. And so the choreography was really challenging. It was a lot of acrobats and crawling up walls on harnesses and flipping. And it was challenging. It was really, really challenging. But it was the most rewarding one of the most rewarding jobs I've had simply because when you look at icons like a Michael Jackson or a James Brown, you then understand why they are icons. And I think a lot of times as consumers, as people who are fans and you love their music and you love to go to their concerts, I think that we look at the end result and oftentimes we don't see all the sacrifice and the blood, sweat and tears that led up to them becoming iconic, like it is a process. It is 10, 12, 13 hour a day rehearsals, nonstop perfecting your craft. And so for me to see Michael Jackson up close and have conversation with them and rehearse with them, I'm like, this is why he's great because there was no, he was very meticulous. There was nothing left untouched. You know, I wanted to look like this. I don't really like this. He was fully involved in the process of the choreography and piecing it together and very vocal and clear about what he wanted and how he wanted it to look. Um, so he had a bunch of professionals around him helping him create this vision. But it, it it's understandable as to why these people are and have succeeded in the ways that they have because they are relentless. They perfect their craft. They will work around the clock. Um, to get things done. And so that was hard work. Um, it was like the costuming was heavy. We were, we had to be painted, your face was painted. It was like 
literally some of the most uncomfortable costuming I've ever been in. Oh, but, you know, it was heavy. It, we were in the middle of the desert shooting in airplane hangers. It was hot. God. Um, sometimes you'd have 3 a.m. calls in the morning. Like it was, it was, but when you look at the end result, it's interesting to see people look at the end result and they have no idea what we went through to create that art. And so, you know, in an extension of growing up around my father and falling asleep in the studio with him while he's making magic, it's hours and hours and hours of work and you sacrifice time with your family, you sacrifice time with your friends. Like, so I'm very familiar with that sacrifice growing up because I was part of that sacrifice. I didn't get to, my dad would be on tour. I didn't get to see him every holiday or every birthday or he was on tour. So when I started working in the business and having an opportunity to work with the James Browns and the, you know, Beyonce's and the Michael Jackson's, I understood. I know why the end result looks the way that it does. And when people are like, oh my God, they're iconic. They're legendary. They're legendary for a reason. And it's a lot of sacrifice to become legendary. Yes. I totally, totally believe that. I totally believe that. And it's important that people realize and hear from someone from inside. Who's yeah. Doing it. It's very important. That's why I asked this question because... I know you don't get like Michael Jackson or Prince. <laughs> without, yeah. Without some sacrifice and with a lot of hard work. And I think, I think with social media, that's the missing piece, right? I think that we live in a, like they say, the microwave generation, like we think things, you know, happen quickly and because of the internet and because of social media platforms, things do happen quickly for some people in comparison. Yes. And so technology has changed all of that. Like you can go into the studio as a singer and you can sing one line and it can be duplicated multiple times throughout the song. Well, when I started singing backgrounds on albums, you had to sing it every time it showed up in the song. And then you have to stack it and do different notes. You're talking nine tracks and three passes and it had to be perfected. And so it's really different. I just feel like the work is different. And I think I think it's showing up in spaces where people don't really respect the amount of work because they're not really having to do it. Yeah. And I think I think they're overinflating um their their talent or overinflating how they got where they they have arrived because they didn't really have to do what other people had to do. Like I didn't have to do what my dad had to do, right? Like he was way before me. So this is a man who was homeless and slept in train cars and ate out of trash cans to realize his dreams. So I think as generationally we keep going, I think the sacrifice and some of the hard work is diminished. And I think that that's a mistake to me. And I think that, which is one of the reasons why they're even doing, you know, National R&B Day to remember you know, this is where it came from. And people need to always respect that and remember that. Thank you for this, because that gives me the hint. Let's talk a little bit about the National R&B Day, the significance of it, the reason why um, Star Karen uh, started it and created it. And it has been proclamated as a national, there is a National Day proclamation now for this. Yes. Yeah, a little bit about that. Um, I just think that it's important because I think that, like I said, with streaming and, um, you know, social media platforms, I think we just don't want R&B, rhythm and blues to get lost in the fray yes. because a lot, the music derives from that, whether it be, you know, like gospel, R&B music, all these things came from the same place. And I think a lot of people made a lot of sacrifices um, did a lot of extraordinary things for Black music to even be respected in the way that it is. And you kind of just, you know, you there's so many spaces where you can find great music now, but if you're turning on the radio, just, um, you know, terrestrial radio, you're like a lot of times R&B music is missing in those spaces and you don't have, you know, when you turn on the award shows, I mean, I've done award shows, like, there's a space for everything, right? And I just don't want 
R&B's music to get diminished in those spaces, whether it become, whether it's rap, rock, hip hop, country, like there's so many different categories. And the reality of it is, is that all of these, all of these genres of music, they derive from R&B music, whether it's the hip hop song that sampled an R&B song, like my dad, James Brown, these men yeah. are singing endlessly. Um, like right now, Rick Ross and um, Meek Mill just released an album. And my dad's song, one of the songs he produced, they sampled it. And which is the funny part about it is my dad, my mother wrote the song. Oh, wow. She wrote lyrically the song. So R&B music. Which will song is that? Um, it's called, they, the, song, the original song was called Shoot Your Best Shot by Linda Clifford. It, it was like 1980. Um, and it, I can't, I don't know the name of the song mm -hmm. that was sampled, but it is on the new album that just came out with Rick Ross and Meek Mill. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to check it out. I like the song. I just can't remember the name of it, but it just goes to show you that R&B has given life to other genres of music and the importance of having a day for R&B music is so that people don't forget that and they respect it and understand that we are standing on the shoulders of people who did R&B music in the 60s. Absolutely. I think R&B music, I think, and it's not just me, R&B music is the source of everything. Mm -hmm. Black music is the source of music. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there is yeah. music without Black music. Yeah. When I was growing up in Italy, that was the music I was listening to, but it wasn't easy to find. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why I live in Harlem is that here I find the music and the culture that I'm attracted to and that speaks yes. to my soul. Yes, definitely. But in Italy, I don't know. I don't <laughs> I don't get the same. And yeah. I'm born and raised in Italy, but Harlem yeah. is my home. I feel well, I, will, I will say that I think that as Americans, we take for granted because we have access to so much music. And I've been overseas a million and one times. Mm -hmm. And the level of adoration and respect that fans give R&B music and Black music and the culture is, um, you know, the best. Like, yeah. bar none. Like, I, I hope that everyone who loves music, loves R&B music, gets to, especially as a performer, gets to experience that kind of love and appreciation from an audience. Because I think sometimes you don't necessarily get it in the same way as an entertainer in America. And you know, that comes also probably from the fact that there is so much quality, so yeah. much excellence here mm -hmm. that yeah. sometimes it gets lost. Yes. In Europe, we don't get it that much or mm -hmm. it's not that kind. Yeah. And so when you finally get it, you appreciate it even more because you know you're not going to have it tomorrow. It's here yeah. now, you know? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a lot of factors that get into that. But uh, uh, what you're saying is, yeah, I understand it. <laughs> so um, we know why it's celebrated now. We know what date, which is the 2nd of March next year. And uh, what what is going to happen during that day? What kind of activities, concerts? What are you going to do, for example, during that day? Something specific for it? So I can't reveal really a lot at this point because details are still being worked out. But there'll be a lot of internet activities, some performances and things like that to contribute to the day. And so that's, you know, that's we can't really reveal too much at this point. But just look out for that day and be on the lookout for for, you know, just the upcoming days mm -hmm. when they start releasing information about what's going to happen on that day. Where should our viewers look for this? Where should they go? Well, and... there's different people. So I, for one, you can find me on all social media platforms as Heather Hayes. I will definitely start posting um, flyers and information about, you know, that particular day and some of the, some of the cool things that you'll be able to see um, and hear about on that day. So just social media. That's what they're, you know, they'll start posting and stuff. Perfect. And then as we just touched on, it was created by Star Carrigan in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, how did you get in touch with Star? How did you meet? So her? actually, someone reached out to me on. Um, I got an inbox, and they asked if I, you know, would the they gave me an explanation about what the day was and they thought it was a propos for me to be a part of it because I basically come from the <laughs> loin of R and B. Um, and so, uh, you know, we got on a call together and she explained what she wanted to do, why she wanted to do it. Um, and I just totally agree. And I was so excited to even be an honor to be asked to be a part of it. And so her and I stay in communication on a regular basis. Um, you know, talking about, I know, working on some other cool things, maybe in the future, but yeah, it was literally, this is the beauty of social media. Like you can find people anywhere. Um, and so, yeah, it was simply an inbox. Um, and I, you know, was able to, you know, have a conversation with her and, you know, she sent me some documentation and the information about, you know, why she wanted to do it, what she wanted to do. And I was in at that point. So. Fantastic. That's the same way she contacted me. So that's mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, let's talk about your what you're doing now and your career, your future, because you have founded the Heather Hi Heather Heiss Experience, and uh, you have performed with many, many important and famous actors and musicians and so on. And that tell us a, a little bit about that. What is that? So. Um... After I got off the road with James Brown, um, I was trying to figure out kind of what I wanted to do, like, because I love to travel, but I did that for like seven years. And that is, you know, I don't think people understand that, you know, in, in the 20th, 21st century, the 20th century, people tour based upon an album release. Well, Mr. Brown was one of those people that you didn't need an album to be released <laughs> on the tour. So when you're talking about on the road, six weeks at a time, year round wow. for seven years, that's just a lot. Like I was gone most of my twenties. Like I just wasn't in the United States or just, I traveled so much. So I was kind of exhausted from that. Um, and then when I decided, I just couldn't figure out what I wanted to do, but I started doing like spot dates, which is why I started working. I worked with briefly sang on Arrested Development, Development's album. I went on a J Japanese tour with them, a brief tour. That's how I started work. I worked with Beyonce, sang background and did a couple of uh, shows like Jay Leno, 106 and Park with her. And so I was just dabbling, doing some things that basically I could do. Like I love to entertain, whether it be singing or whether it be dancing. I was relatively good at both. Mm -hmm. um, and one of my friends spoke to me about bands and I just love live music and that probably comes from my dad and James Brown because they both have massive live bands with horn sections mm -hmm. and I just really loved it and so they were like well you can do there's a private sector of entertainment where you go around and you entertain companies and private parties and so I started dabbling in that in other people's bands but what I discovered is I just kind of felt like it wasn't um, like at the end of the day, if you step on the stage in front of people that have paid for you to be there, then why not present a show? And in that moment, in some of the spaces I was in, I was like, well, nobody's doing any dance steps, like their costumes are drab. Like that's just really how I felt about it. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I want to create a band that displays what I've learned from all these incredible people and all these incredible stages that I've been on. Like I've been on stages in Italy and Paris and Belgium and Lebanon. Like I've been all over the world. I've done the Soul Train Music Awards, the American Music Awards, 106 in Park, Jay Leno, David Letterman. Like I've done all these things. So why not bring those experiences to a private party? And that is why I created the Heather Hayes Experience. And we basically travel around, travel around the world because we do not just the States, we've been overseas multiple times and we just entertain private parties. It's a big band. It's an 11 piece band. Wow. It has horn, rhythm section, a bunch of fabulous singing girls that can blow their faces off, changing costumes, male singers, choreography. So I brought that into spaces that were not custom, that, that's not what was normally done. Yes. And I think I was met with a little resistance in, initially. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, I would 
our costumes and people will be like, well, you look like you're in a music video. And I'm like, exactly. That's kind yeah. of the point. <laughs> you know, but once I started hearing clients say, oh my God, I thought I was at a concert. You know, I, I forgot I was at a birthday party or I forgot I was at a corporate. That was the goal. And so that's basically why I started it because I think that people need to understand that there is several ways to fulfill your dreams. Mm -hmm. If your dream and your desire to sing and perform and dance is pure, like it's not all about being famous. It's not all about being, you know, having a million dollar record deal. It's like, if you love to do it, you will find a way to do it. And so that's essentially what I did. I have recorded, um, I've recorded two singles, which is kind of, you know, uh, appropriate at this time because it's getting ready to be the holidays. Um, I re-recorded my father's Christmas song, The Mistletoe and Me. Wow. And he recorded that song before I was born, like in the 60s, late 60s. Um, and so I decided to re-record it um, a year ago. And so it was, it's been played on Christmas, you know, during Christmas time on stations and stuff. And so I'm so proud of that work because um, I kind of transformed what he did and turned it into what I love to do. But it was important um, because Christmas was my dad's favorite holiday. And he always made our Christmases so incredibly special and fun. And so it, in a way it was a tribute to him and just kind of, it all kind of came together because it's where I come from. It's, it's in my DNA that I love music. I've always genuinely organically loved it. And so that also is, it's all on, um, you know, any, you can stream it, you can buy it, iTunes, all those Amazon music. It's there. It's called the mistletoe me by Heather Hayes featuring group centric. And so I just love what I do. And so I just try to do different things. And it's not about, oh, I'm not famous enough. You know, I just want to put great work out there and great art out there and make people happy in any space that I'm in. That's so beautiful what you're saying, because it's like a recipe for happiness, really. Yeah. Well, you got to do what you love. To I mean, I feel like you should do what you love. And that will bring happiness and everything else will come, right? You don't, I just feel like you got to be pure. You got to be organic. Um, it can't be because you, I want to be rich. I want to be famous. Do what you love and everything else will follow. And it, this is the reason if, because most people don't do it for that reason. Most yeah. people do it for, I want to be known. I want to be rich. I want to be famous. Yes. But you have tried it, you've been on tour, you realize what is good for you and what is not as good for you. And you found your, your own formula for living your life the way you want to with your music, yes. your dancing. Yes, definitely. Because I think that, I think that like the old saying is all that glitters isn't gold. And so when it comes to fame and money and all those things, I think people need to realize, like, I grew up like that. So there is a dark side to that. There is a not so happy side to that. There is a lot of sacrifices that come with that. And so I had to find a space that made me happy, that I can take care of myself in the fashion that I want to be taken care of, but I can do what I love to do in those spaces. Um, and so I, I love the fact that we're in a space now where you can record and make great music and put it up on iTunes yourself. And if people love it, you know, they'll buy it or they'll stream it. And, and so it's just less pressure, I think. Um, and I think that you can kind of focus on the art and your craft as opposed to all the other stuff, all the other noise that's around a lot of that most times. Wonderful. Your next project. And then we are. So I'm actually doing some more original music. Um, you know, working on an EP, I actually have tons of music, um, but trying to, you know, figure out which direction, um, I want the music to go. Um, and so hopefully in the spring, beginning of summer, those, you know, that EP will be out and I do, um, tribute shows. So I have a tribute, um, called Hot Buttered Soul and I tribute my dad and I do all the songs that he wrote, produced and performed in the show. A lot of them. Because people, you know, probably don't maybe realize that he got to start in the music industry being a writer. So a lot of those Sam and Dave songs, Hold On, I'm Coming, Soul Man, my dad uh, produced those, wrote and produced those. And so we perform a lot of those songs in the show. Um, and I tell stories in the show. 
because a lot of those songs have a specific meaning to me and my family or my mother or my dad. And, and so it's a really cool show and it's a really uh, wonderful way to tribute him and all the work that he's put in and given to R&B music. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is that I also do something with Daughters of Legacy. Yes. And a lot of people call us legacies because our parents have created, you know, legendary work in the space of music. And it, it comprises of Keisha Jackson, her mother is Millie Jackson, Aisha Wright, her mother is Betty Wright, mm -hmm. myself, of course, my dad's Isaac Hayes, um, and Nesby's daughter, Jamesia Bennett. Um, we have, you know, sometimes we, we kind of switch it up who's the lineup, but Issa Pointer, her mother is Ruth Pointer, her father is Dennis Edwards. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we might have a guest appearance from Robin Charles, her father is Ray Charles. And so people are always surprised that we kind of know each other, but we all individually actually was doing this for a living. Like it wasn't, it's not a fad. It's not any of those things. I mean, most of us have worked, you people have worked for like Shaka Khan, Outkast, like San Tony Braxton's album. Like we've all really done this work. Like we do this for real. And so it was Keisha Jackson's brainchild to bring us all together and do a show that um, showcases our parents' music like even the sampling sampled versions of those that, that music and then our original music. And we actually have a song that we released um the end of the summer. I'm um, called You Better Know. It's on iTunes. It's Daughters of Legacy. You guys should look that up too. It's a great, it's 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 a nice bop. Um, we're working on some some more music with that as well. So we have shows coming up with Daughters of Legacy. I have shows coming up with Hot Buttered Soul. And of course the Heather Hayes experience, you know, it it performs year round and my EP should be out the end of the spring, beginning of the summer. We are going to look it up. And I would like you, if you have a show coming to New York or in this area, please let me know because that oh, definitely will. the daughters of the legacy sound <laughs> like, wow. Like it's, it's an amazing show. It's an amazing yeah. show. People will be, I think people are surprised. Because I think oftentimes people think, oh, if your parent is a singer, you think you can be a singer. And I'm like, no, our parents didn't play that. Like our parents were like, you need to, you need to practice. You need to get this together. You know what I mean? And so we were very specific to make sure that we were, you know, uh, we worked on our craft, I would say. And most of us worked in the industry on a regular basis. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not something a gimmick. Just, yeah. Put together. Yeah, it's not something and do just, you know when is the next show? For that? Um, the Daughters of Legacy. Uh, I don't have my schedule in front of me, but I don't think it's, I think I want to say it's out of the country, actually. So I don't have my schedule in front of me. But I, again, those are things you can follow Daughters of Legacy official on all social media platforms, too. And we usually post where we're going to be um, for that. And the videos up, the videos on YouTube. Um, I'll, I'll probably, they'll probably start playing my Christmas song, The Mistletoe on Me, because the holidays are coming. There's a video for that also. Um, that you can check out on YouTube. So, you know, we just got a lot of things working, but like I said, I just love to sing and dance and entertain. And so I will continue to do it as long as the good Lord allows me. <laughs> Thank you so much for this very, very, very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very appreciated that you found the time to be with us and with my have important users. So thank you. Thank you. And the show airs every Saturday at 1230 on Spectrum 1993. And you can see this whole interview on my YouTube channel, which is also called My Harlem Portrait. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>